minutes leave. So uh, we're back on the air uh, on our webcast um, to a briefing of the BBG. I'd like to introduce um, a uh, wonderful civil ser servant who is serving, as you can see, in a very glamorous location um, north of here with the president uh, and who I consider my boss in this job. So, Ben, sorry you can't be here. Hopefully you can be here in a future board meeting. But thanks for uh, addressing us here today. I want you to take it away. Well, uh, thanks, Jeff. And again, I, I'm sorry I, I couldn't be there. I intended to be in town um, this week. But uh, with all the um, circumstances taking place around the world, um, particularly in Iraq, um, uh, the national security staff uh, is providing some additional support here uh, to the president. Uh, at the same time, uh, a commitment to Jeff Shell is uh, unbreakable, uh, in my view. So uh, I was glad that through uh, technology, I'm able to join you. Um, let me just begin by um, thanking you, uh, Jeff, and the rest of the board for uh, your leadership. Um, I think we're very enthusiastic that uh, after some turnover, uh, we now have a very strong board in place uh, at a critical time uh, that's going to bring uh, new energy uh, and expertise to uh, U.S. international broadcasting. So let me just begin by thanking you for what you're doing uh, to enhance Voice of America, um, Radio Free Europe, um, the other components of our international uh, broadcasting, Radio Free Asia, uh, Office of Cuba Broadcasting. Um, so uh, I just want to let you know that, uh, for starters, President Obama um, has been uh, increasingly focused on this issue of international broadcasting. Um, he, we have updated him uh, on the efforts that the, the BBG is undertaking, and the various reform proposals um, that are moving forward. Um, uh, we recently were able to meet with him uh, to go through those uh, different proposals. Uh, you know, he reiterated both the historic legacy uh, of U.S. international broadcasting uh, throughout the Cold War and the years that followed, uh, but also I think identified that we are at a um, critical moment uh, where we need to uh, up our own game here. Um, uh, let me also just say at the outset that uh, we're very grateful to the thousands of journalists, communications professionals uh, who are dedicated to this mission, uh, particularly those who are helping to get um, information into some of the more uh, remote uh, and, frankly, repressed uh, corners of the globe uh, where people are not able to receive uh, independent sources of news and information. Uh, we know that this comes at a great sacrifice, uh, and I know uh, in particular we're thinking of uh, Basha Fami, the al Hura correspondent who uh, has tragically been missing uh, for two years in Syria. Um, so just to step back and, and frame uh, the discussion, um, we see um, uh, an increasing need um, for information to reach um, peoples, again, who are in areas where they cannot access information. Um, the traditional role uh, of uh, the BBG in helping to facilitate the flow of information uh, around the world. Um, but also, just frankly, uh, we see an increasingly populated space um, around the world. Uh, Russia today, uh, for instance, has obviously been uh, very broadly disseminated. Um, as well as um, other state media uh, and independent media. Uh, and it's a good time for us to step back and think through uh, how the U.S. is um, uh, communicating, how the uh, independent um, uh, agencies under BBG uh, are operating, uh, and what additional steps uh, that we can uh, do to, uh, again, uh, meet the challenge of uh, getting information out uh, in an increasingly um, competitive environment. Um, we welcome the fact that there have been uh, serious efforts on the Hill um, in both houses of Congress uh, to address some of the challenges confronting uh, the BBG uh, and to make sure you have the tools, authorities, and structures needed to uh, communicate with the global audience uh, here in the 21st century. Um, I think I'd just say about the reform efforts that we agree with the broad aims uh, of the reform. Uh, we do uh, believe that uh, the structural and strategic challenges faced by the BBG uh, need to be addressed, uh, and that doing so will strengthen American foreign policy, uh, increase uh, understanding of our view of uh, critical issues, uh, and open up access to information. Uh, we are engaging Congress uh, on the proposed governance structure, however. Uh, we have expressed uh, some concerns about the creation of two separate boards and two separate CEOs. Uh, given that the challenge that uh, has been identified is improving coordination, uh, we believe that duplication of effort could actually 
uh, compromise our ability uh, to get better at coordination. Um, so again, uh, we want to see uh, reform efforts that don't have a duplication of effort that could uh, decrease our effectiveness. Um, and again, the difference uh, in governing structures for BBG already uh, has served as one of the management challenges for the organization. Uh, so we have recommended the creation of a single oversight structure for U.S. international broadcasting uh, as the best way uh, to provide that umbrella uh, to reform. Um, we also believe that the State Department needs to have a, a seat at the table. Um, again, uh, while um, BBG carries out its mission, State is obviously um, communicating on behalf of the United States around the globe. Um, and again, we believe that uh, the State Department uh, needs to have a seat at the table uh, on the board for the grantee organizations. Um, again, um, this role um, on the board has enabled the State Department to provide foreign policy guidance and input uh, so that um, the BBG can understand uh, what the priorities and strategies of the U.S. government are uh, as they make decisions about uh, resources. Uh, and without this input, we believe uh, broadcasters will be handicapped uh, in their ability to achieve the stated mission of advancing freedom and democracy uh, and supporting open societies and, and information. Um, in addition to the structural reforms, um, we believe it's important to address uh, strategic requirements for U.S. international broadcasting. Um, and that goes, uh, frankly, beyond uh, some of the reforms in the legislation. Um, so, for instance, we believe it's important to shift additional resources uh, to engage global audiences uh, and to focus locally only when there are compelling reasons um, to do so. Uh, we're in a global um, uh, information environment. Uh, we need to have the ability to communicate globally. There will, of course, be um, priority countries, uh, for instance, countries where there is not access to free information, uh, where it will be necessary to communicate uh, locally uh, and specifically uh, in certain language and with certain publics, uh, but we don't want the local mission um, to come at the expense of also uh, having uh, the ability to broadcast and communicate uh, globally. Um, we also, frankly, need uh, a capacity um, to produce uh, compelling and relevant content for that uh, global audience uh, as well. Um, and that includes looking at producing um, beyond news, but also uh, other programs that, frankly, meet the audience where they are uh, with the type of content that they're seeking. Um, and nobody should be better at that than the United States of America, um, given uh, our mix um, generally of uh, not just um, being the leader in the world at having an independent uh, media and a vibrant press, uh, but also being a cultural leader in the world. Uh, again, we believe that uh, the ability to meet people um, with their information needs and the information they're seeking uh, is going to be critical for the BBG going forward. And uh, if you look across the world, that can be everything from uh, the use of mobile technology in places like Africa, where people are increasingly drawing not just on radio, but uh, on, their, uh, on their phones, um, to uh, reaching people with content and on the appropriate platforms uh, in Asia, where we see an explosion uh, of consumers uh, of different media, uh, and particularly in uh, Southeast Asia. Um, so uh, as we make this transition, um, we also want to make sure that we're making best use of the traditional platforms that we have in place. Uh, as I said, radio is still an important medium for reaching uh, audiences, particularly in Africa, um, but we want to uh, make sure that as we look at different regions, uh, we're you know, keeping the foundation uh, of the traditional platforms as necessary, um, but also looking at video, mobile, and online uh, production. Um, but again, just to conclude here, um, if you look across the spectrum, I think we have a huge opportunity. Uh, I think people recognize the valuable and critical tool of international broadcasting and, and engaging global audiences. Uh, people recognize the competitive nature of the space um, that we're confronted with uh, as other nations move out very aggressively into the international broadcasting space. Um, so the need is there. Uh, and whether it's dealing with uh, making sure that there's good information uh, that people can access uh, in places like uh, Eastern Europe, where we see Russia very active, uh, whether it's engaging emerging audiences uh, in critical regions like Sub-Saharan Africa and Southeast Asia, of course, the Middle East and North Africa, uh, or whether it is, again, moving into uh, additional content uh, that builds on uh, the journalistic foundation of BBG uh, to meet those consumers uh, of information where they are. Uh, I think if we get the reform process right with Congress um, and we get the strategic vision, uh, Jeff, that you and the border setting uh, in place, we can really have a, an enormous legacy uh, for 
taking stock of where the world is uh, in the 21st century uh, and having an international broadcasting structure that, uh, that uh, is a tool uh, to advance uh, American values for, for many years to come. Uh, and just again, to, to close it, this is gonna be a partnership. Um, the people in Congress uh, who have been focused on this have brought, I think, very good ideas to the table, very good energy to the table, and are getting at some of these structural issues in, in ways that are very important. Uh, the new board brings uh, a, a lot of uh, new strategic vision and, and a variety of expertise from different backgrounds uh, to this conversation as well. Uh, and I can commit to you that President Obama is personally uh, focused and engaged on this very topic. Uh, and again, um, not only will I be engaged in this, but with Rick Stengel, uh, a very excellent undersecretary now in place at the State Department, uh, I think we had the right team to, uh, to make uh, a really lasting contribution uh, to the United States um, that could benefit uh, our values, uh, our interests uh, for many years to come. So Jeff, I'm happy to, to have a conversation or uh, do whatever you'd like. Great. Uh, ben, first of all, thank you for making the time. I know I know you, you got a crazy schedule up there. And uh, I also want to thank you on behalf of the board for this board. It is a um, we're still down. We have two nominees pending and we still are down two spots. So we do need to kind of fill out the board at some point. And I know the, the personnel office and McConnell's office are working hard on that. But I do want to thank you for the mix of people that you've you've given me to work with. I think we have a great a great group here and we're all working hard and and, and trying to make progress here. Um, a, lot of, a, lot of, a lot of places around the world need attention, so it gets more challenging every day, but thanks, thanks for being here. I, you know, I, uh, if you have a couple minutes to take questions, um, it would be great, but if any, anybody from the board or any, sure. anybody else has a question for Ben, now's your, now's your shot, although he'll be in person at some point. I'm, I'm not going to be shy. I always have some, but Rick, oh, okay. why don't you start? Hey, Ben. How are you? It's Rick Stengel. Um, hey, Rick. Since, we, since I was originally going to have a conversation with you and, and put on my old hat as a journalist, uh, I have this list of 123 questions that I <laughs> want to ask you. Um, but I, but um, what, what I'd love, actually, just because we, have, we did have a presentation today uh, from RFE, RFERL, and um, the efforts they're making um, in and around Ukraine. Um, I'd love you to talk a little bit about your, um, what you're seeing and your vision for how we uh, compete in this uh, information marketplace where, uh, where the Russians are spending um, billions of dollars. And uh, one of the things that I've seen and been surprised by in my time here is, is just uh, how sophisticated their messaging is on social media. and you know, like you, I thought, well, this is, this is an area that we should own, and, and we don't really own it. And um, I, I think everybody would benefit from, from your uh, vision of how this is playing out. Well, it's a perfect test case for the environment we're in, Rick. Um, and uh, I'd note um, at the front end that uh, state has been very aggressive uh, in using uh, its communications tools to communicate uh, into Ukraine uh, and the broader region. Um, but I'll say a word about uh, what we see in terms of uh, Russia, uh, and then a word about uh, what we might consider going forward. Um, you know, the Russians have put an enormous amount of resources uh, into their broadcasting and their messaging. Um, and we see that, you know, most acutely on Russia today. Um, but if you look at the information space uh, in Ukraine, uh, in uh, the broader uh, Eastern European region, um, the Russians are using uh, many different platforms. Um, you see things on YouTube, you see things on Twitter, uh, you see a broader use of social media uh, that incorporates um, their television broadcasting but goes way, way beyond it. Um, and so the message uh, that we've seen is often one of misinformation, uh, misinformation about uh, who and what the government in Kiev uh, is and what they're doing, uh, misinformation uh, about the nature of U.S. support to Ukraine. Um, and Frankly, uh, we have to recognize that uh, if you're a consumer and all you're getting uh, are bad facts, um, uh, you don't uh, necessarily have the basis for knowing uh, that it's not true uh, that the Ukrainian government is uh, you know, made up of fascists, uh, but was rather democratically elected and is seeking to uh, pursue uh, uh, and has offered a path of uh, de-escalation there. Um, so in terms of the content, 
uh, we see, uh, again, a lot of misinformation uh, that aims to essentially deceive people about what's taking place. Uh, on the other end of the spectrum, uh, as I mentioned, we see the use of many different platforms, not just television, not just radio. Um, so for us, uh, I think what that means is uh, if we're going to carry out our mission, uh, we have to be very aggressive uh, in correcting misinformation uh, and getting out the facts of what uh, is taking place in Ukraine. The fact that it was Ukraine's sovereignty and territorial integrity that was violated. The fact that the Ukrainian people held a successful election uh, of this new government. The fact that the Ukrainian government uh, had a ceasefire and a peace plan on the table uh, that was rejected uh, by the Russians uh, and the Russian-backed separatists. Uh, the facts that uh, we very much believe that uh, MH17 was shot down, uh, not by the Ukrainians, as Russia uh, has alleged, uh, but rather by a surface air, air missile that came from uh, the territory held by the Russian-backed separatists. So we need the content to push back, but we also need to be on all of these different platforms. Uh, we need to be, again, meeting uh, people where they're receiving information. And again, that includes television, radio, but increasingly it includes social media as well. Uh, so the ability to get information out, correct information out, uh, and to do it on uh, all the various platforms that people consume news and information, uh, I think uh, Ukraine offers a perfect test case of what we're up against in terms of the challenge for uh, international broadcasting going forward. Go ahead, go ahead, Matt. Yeah, <clears throat> I, I actually don't don't have a question. The, the questions I, I have, I, I don't know, they're open forum questions. But I just this is Matt Armstrong. I just want to say thank you for your time. Thank you for what what you've said. I appreciate it. And uh, I have to leave, so I just want to make sure you didn't take it personally. <laughs> so um, again, appreciate it. And I know Jeff and, and Rick and, and uh, Ambassador Croc will ask some good questions. So again, thank you for your time. And Ben, while How Matt's while Ben while Matt's uh, gathering his stuff here to go, he just completed with a number of the board members uh, and a number of the staff here hundreds of hours of work of assessing shortwave. There's something I told you about last time we talked, um, and it gives yeah. us a real good foundation for a keeping shortwave in a couple critical places around the world where it's still effective, and b uh, giving us the 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 foundation to make some hard choices in other places where we can move to more effective mediums like FM and and new media. So as we kind of grapple with not just the regional kind of continuum that you talk about, it's the the technological continuum. You know, Matt's done really really good work on his committee of of uh, of, of providing us with a shortwave kind of basis. Thanks, Matt. That's great, and I appreciate the work given. Uh, you know, the deep legacy. Uh, that BBG has in shortwave, uh, the need to make sure we have that as an asset going forward, uh, even as we, again, look at uh, a broader range of uh, platforms. So, Ben, I'm going to ask kind of an unanswerable question, but, you know, nine months ago, um, when we got our guidance from the White House, my first, my first year here at BBG, um, the, the guidance basically was in line with the administration's pivot to Asia. Let's focus more on the emerging markets in Asia. Um, and let's let make sure we don't ignore Africa, where there's a lot of stuff going on in Africa, particularly the youth of Africa, um, that's going to impact the United States, which at the time I thought was a very thoughtful policy. I know Radio Free Asia has been doing great work, and we, we have no shortage of places that we need to do, you know, need, need more resources in Asia. And then all of a sudden, Putin decides to be a dictator again and, and, and blows up. How do you... You know, as we're grappling with all the regions around the world in a micro sense, how do you and the president in a macro sense, you know, how are you up there approaching the world when you have so many fires going on um, everywhere around the world? Well, it's a great question, Jeff. Um, uh, let me just say a couple of things. Uh, first of all, you know, we're dealing with a range of crises. Um, in uh, the Middle East, obviously, we're very focused on uh, Iraq and Syria and um, you know, Ambassador Crocker knows more uh, than anybody, uh, frankly, about uh, the challenges we're facing there. Um, in Russia uh, and in Ukraine, uh, we have uh, a threat to the basic European order uh, and European security uh, that uh, goes beyond what we've seen in many years. Uh, you know, it, it does bear some resemblance to what Russia has done in places like Georgia and Transnistria in the past, but uh, given the sustained nature uh, of their uh, violation of Ukraine's sovereignty, it certainly has merited a lot of our attention. Uh, at the same time, though, uh, we're trying to be very deliberate and not losing sight of the opportunities uh, in the world today. 
Um, so for instance, even in the midst of these crises, uh, last week the president was able to host for the very first time uh, a head of state summit uh, with 50 uh, African countries uh, to build out an agenda uh, where we're getting more trade and investment in Africa, where our development assistance uh, has lasting outcomes in, in terms of building African capacity. We're building new partnerships on areas like peacekeeping. Um, so uh, we're fully focused on seizing that opportunity, even as we deal with uh, crises. Same thing with the Asia Pacific region. When you look at the strategic interest of the United States going forward uh, in the 21st century, um, the Asia Pacific has got to be uh, front and center for our attention. Uh, and you see that with the fact that this is the largest emerging market in the world. Uh, there are uh, huge growing populations. Uh, there are democratic allies of the United States and emerging dem democracies like uh, Malaysia and Indonesia that are playing a greater role. Um, so I think the point is that if we assess the broader landscape uh, of the world, the fact of US leadership remains, we're the only country uh, that truly operates globally and can truly mobilize collective action. Uh, and yes, we have to make sure that we're putting resources uh, against urgent crises like those we face in the Middle East uh, and in uh, Ukraine. Uh, at the same time, uh, we, we cannot lose sight of uh, the opportunities for the United States. And again, we see, uh, as we look out at the world, uh, in Latin America, in Sub-Saharan Africa, and in Southeast Asia, uh, enormous opportunities uh, to build uh, relationships that are really going to advance our interest economically, security, our values. Um, so. There are always resource trade-offs, and we have to be honest about those. Um, but I think that uh, we need to make sure that even as we are dedicating urgent attention, um, we also have a, a long view of how the U.S. is postured globally. Uh, and if you look at the population numbers, the economic growth numbers, uh, the democracies that are emerging, uh, that is going to have to sustain uh, a focus on Africa uh, and Asia, as we talked about in that very first discussion. Great. Um Without any more questions, do you, do you have a question? One question for Carlos Garcia, who runs our Cuba um, service. Go ahead, Carlos. Hi, Ben. Sorry. Why well, am I not doing it right? Here. There you go. You're okay, on. I'm just going to keep it. I'm just going to. I'm sorry. It's I can hear you, Carlos. Yep. How are you? Um, how, how do you view the, the, the U.S.-Mexican border uh, the crisis that we have now? Um, do you view it as a foreign policy issue, and what steps need to be taken to solve that, and how the BBG as an entity can help to solve that problem on a long-term basis? Well, it's a good question. It's obviously um, both in the sense that it has uh, implications for our foreign policy and for our domestic policy. Uh, on the domestic side, uh, clearly, the president's preference has been to have comprehensive immigration reform, um, uh, as well as to provide additional resources to deal with the urgent situation at the border. Um, he'll be making some decisions, obviously, in the coming days, uh, given the absence of a congressional uh, action. Uh, I uh, can't uh, speak to those. That's kind of out of my lane. Um, but I will say on the foreign policy side, um, I think the, there are a number of steps that we've been focused on. One is with the crisis at the border. Uh, making sure that people in Central America in particular understand that it is not safe uh, to be sending unaccompanied children uh, to the United States, uh, that they are vulnerable um, to being exploited um, along the way, uh, and that there is not uh, an immigration system uh, that uh, is ready uh, to absorb people who arrive here, um, uh, again, uh, without uh, proper uh, without going through the proper uh, courses of action. So we've been focused from a communication side, and I think this is uh, what would be relevant to the BBG, uh, on making sure that people um, in Central American countries uh, understand that uh, and that they are properly uh, informed and educated about the risks of uh, sending children, um, uh, again, up to the U.S. border. Uh, and the, President Obama uh, delivered that message when he met with uh, several Central American leaders. Vice President Biden, Secretary Kerry did uh, in their travels to the region. Um, but again, people need to, to understand um, uh, that uh, sending uh, children, uh, unaccompanied children in particular, to the United States uh, is a dangerous proposition given uh, their vulnerability uh, along the way. Uh, and that also 
uh, our immigration system uh, cannot simply uh, absorb them here uh, in the United States when they uh, get across the border. Uh, so there's an educational um, function that comes with our communications uh, that is critically important. You know, at the same time, I think everybody recognizes that even if we were to have comprehensive immigration reform, uh, in the long term, the U.S. has uh, a profound interest in the continued economic development uh, of Latin America, uh, continued efforts to improve citizen security in places like Central America that have been so vulnerable uh, to violence and have seen such high rates of violence, um, so that you know, even as we're focused on fixing our immigration system, we have to be focused on partnering with these countries uh, to frankly create the conditions whereby people are finding opportunity in security where they live uh, and are not needing uh, to uh, necessarily leave their countries in order uh, to find it. Uh, so I think that's all uh, a critical mission for all of our uh, broadcasting um, in the region. Uh, it's certainly been a, a key priority of our uh, communications uh, to Latin America. Um, and, you know, again, this is an area where the United States has so many uh, opportunities to engage, um, again, not just through uh, our traditional broadcasting and, and communication out of the government, uh, but their family ties that extend across uh, borders, their cultural ties. Uh, we want to be leveraging all of those uh, as we're uh, really dealing with not just an immigration challenge here and a crisis on the border, but uh, a broader uh, joint effort and equal partnership uh, to advance security and, and prosperity in the Americas. Thank you. Thanks, Ben. Um, I think we're going to let you go, given that you've got lots of, lots of golf and beach activities to get to up there. So th sorry you couldn't. I, I know you wanted to be here today, and sorry you couldn't be here today. You have an open invitation. Rick, I've seen his questions. He's got a lot of questions. So Hopefully you can you can make it here um, at some point in a future board meeting and and good luck with the work up there and thanks on behalf of the whole board and all the people here for your not just being here today but your support of BBG and and work with me and everybody else to to support the efforts. Uh, happy to do it, Jeff. And again, I think uh, you've got a real uh, opportunity with this team in place and with the uh, interest in Congress. We'll be working with uh, you and Congress on these reform efforts um, in the months ahead. Uh, and look forward to everything that you're going to do there. And uh, also look forward to uh, Dana Shell Smith taking up her post uh, as a U.S. ambassador to, to Qatar as well. <laughs> so the Shell family is well represented in our foreign policy. Thank you, Ben. Thanks for the support there, too. And my daughter is right behind us. We got another Shell here. But anyway, have a, have a good afternoon, Ben. Thanks for being here. Thanks. Great. Thanks, guys. Okay, so that concludes our briefing. I did not plan the sister shout out but <laughs> thanks for everything that worked out right